my screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining AME Graduate Students Community Fall 2020 Seminar Series. Today we are hosting Professor Carolyn Sipersad. And uh, before introducing Professor Sipersad, I would like to give an introduction about what we are doing on graduate students uh, community. Uh, here is the leadership team for academic year 2020. Uh, Rodney and Roshan are the coaches. Raj Mohan, Tarun, and Rachel uh, and me uh, are responsible for the publicity. And our support team, uh, Anirban, Emmanuel, and Mignot are the members of the support team. And Robert take care of correspondence. And Farouk is our faculty mentor. Um, we have weekly meetings. Uh, Fridays at 4 p.m. And because of the pandemics, all the meetings are via Zoom. Uh, so you are very welcome to join our weekly meetings. We, we discuss different topics, our events, seminars, and uh, social life activities, and how we can enrich graduate students' uh, lives at the University of Oklahoma. You can contact Rodney and Roshan to join our meetings. And also, if you would like to be a member, be a GSC member, uh, so I'm waiting for a couple of seconds here, so you can scan the, this QR code and log in with your OUID, and uh, that's all. Okay, and here is our Facebook page, and uh, we post everything about GSC and uh, some news about the university, about the events, about the social activities and information about graduate students' life. So, and if you have any questions, you can post or send a message. We will get back to you as soon as we get your message. And we have a couple of uh, upcoming events. Next Thursday, Dr. Mahmoud Asek from Amtrak Corporation uh, we'll be talking about analytics for digital transformation of a uh, passenger railroad. And uh, the week after, on Wednesday, uh, November 11th, Dr. Preston Larson from OU Electron uh, Microscopy Lab will be talking about characterization techniques at OU Electron uh, Microscopy Laboratory. Okay, with that, uh, today, um, Professor C. Persad will be talking about process aware design for additive manufacturing. Uh, professor C. Persad uh, is Professor J. Mike Walker, Professor of Mechanical Engineering from the University, at the University of Texas at Austin. She's also a member of the UT System Academy of Distinguished Teachers and she holds a PhD from, uh, in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech and an MBA in philosophy, politics and economics from Oxford University. Uh, she has a, BA, a bachelor in mechanical engineering from West Virginia University. Professor Sifrasad's research interests involves the development of methods and computational tools from engineering design and advertising and additive manufacturing. With that, please uh, join me to welcome uh, Professor Sipusa. All right, great. Thank you, Areza, for that kind introduction. Let me just um, pull up my screen here to share my slides, and then we'll get started. One second here as we get things going. All right. So thank you so much, Reza, for the kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak. This is a this is a treat. I was um, on a Zoom call a few minutes ago with some of my students, and they they teased me about giving a talk at OU. They said, "Well, they must have really wanted you to talk if they were willing to invite somebody from Texas to to speak." So anyway, I'm pleased to be here today.
um, to speak with all of you. And so before I get started, let me just acknowledge, <clears throat> I love to put other people's names on my title slide because I think that the work that I describe is really a tribute uh, more to my students, my graduate students than it, than it is to me um, and all the hard work that they've done behind the scenes to, to complete all of the work that I'll talk about today, as well as all the collaborators and the support um, funding agencies who've made this work possible. So um, those of you who are familiar with additive manufacturing have done, built some parts, you'll know that um, you know, defects and, and variability are pretty common in additive, additive manufacturing. And they're more common, I think, than in other conventional processes, partly because um, some of the other conventional processes we use like molding and casting and machining, um, we've been doing them for longer. So we understand them better. And to some extent, some of those processes also have uh, fewer um, variables, right? Fewer things that we're trying to adjust at once to get good parts. Um, and so we'll often find, you know, parts are too small or too large. They don't mate properly or if they're supposed to turn um, or move as they come out of the, the additive manufacturing machine, they may not. They may have over, overbuilt, over centered, and they're no longer moving. We try to always push the boundaries usually on additive and have things as thin as possible or as small as possible. Um, partly because we're trying to make things lightweight and get all sorts of advantages out of this process. Um, and so as a result, as we push it to its boundaries, we find lots of defects. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a lot about architected materials. Um, and so these are a couple of examples here. You can see um, a sequence of octet trusses that are built here as part of a lattice structure. But if we zoom in on that lattice structure and look and see exactly what it looks like and how high quality the individual really tiny struts are in this lattice structure might be a little bit disappointed. So what looks great here from a distance actually doesn't look so good when you zoom in. Lots of surface roughness, lots of what we call anisotropy, which means that instead of being isotropic and having equivalent properties from all directions, um, materials, parts that are built using additive are often anisotropic and have very different properties depending on the direction. And depending on the process, that could be for a number of reasons. Um, if you took a cross section of one of these little struts here that make up this um, lattice structure, that compose this lattice structure, you'll see something that looks a little bit like this and you'll see some of the problems that, are, that arise. What should be perfectly circular in cross section is clearly not. Um, so there's a lot of surface roughness and you can see that manifested here. This is a powder-based process. So a laser is centering powder to build this part. And you can see actually some residual powder that's left over in some of this surface roughness. Um, so we need to be able to deal with these defects and things like that that we see. And it's not easy um, because in order to be able to design well for additive and really get the advantages that we seek, we have to be able to deal with the variability that um, is inherent to some of these processes. So there's at least three different ways that we can attack that variability and one is very, very common um, in the manufacturing community right now is to try to reduce the variation that we see from manu additive manufacturing processes. So a primary example of that is what we call predictive process control. So being able to monitor um, a process as it's building parts, use that monitoring or sensing information to feed it back into a con control scheme, often with the help of other models. Um, AI, machine learning models, surrogate models are very important here to be able to take sensor data, use it to, to understand how the process is behaving and then to correct it so that it's better, it's on the mark, it's on target. Um, but today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some ways that we can characterize that variation, assuming it exists. So these, prop, these techniques are, are seriously needed to be able to reduce variability, to better understand it, to better control it. But there'll always be some variability and we'll always be pushing the boundary in terms of what we can design and build. So a couple of other techniques we can use. One is to characterize the variability or the variation that we see. So if we tell it to build a part that looks like this with these thin walls here that are maybe, you know, half a millimeter thick to a millimeter thick, what variability could we expect to see in thickness, in curvature, in surface roughness? Can we characterize that? And if we characterize that, then we can take that information and we can build it into the design process. And so here we need then computationally efficient ways to take that information into account. Um, and if we know um, what levels of anisotropy or direction dependence we get and what levels of variability we have, 
then we can also bring that into the design process and um, complete a design process that's what I call more AM informed. So instead of being agnostic to how you fabricate it, you really take this information into account from the very beginning. So I'm gonna cover two examples today um, that kind of explore a couple of these different routes for handling variability. And the first is gonna be a metamaterial meta example where we use test artifacts to characterize variation. And then we look at computationally efficient design exploration that takes that variation into account. So we have reliably manufacturable parts that come out. The second example is gonna be a lattice structure example where we characterize the direction dependent properties of our process. And then we use that and take that information and take it into account while we're designing lattices. So let's look at the first example. Um, to see, to kind of understand the background, I want to go back to some work we did a few years ago in designing energy absorbing honeycombs. So you may be familiar with standard honeycombs. They're often hexagonal, but they can have other cross-sectional forms as well. And one of their unique characteristics is absorbing energy. And it's not too different actually from the cross-section of cardboard, for example, that might be used in packaging. The difficulty is that once they absorb energy, they plastically deform. Um, and they need to be replaced before the next impact absorption event. So we've designed some honeycombs instead that can absorb energy through um, elastic buckling. And then once the impact is removed, they return to their original state and they're ready for the next impact event. So I'll show you um, a uh, video here. Hopefully I can get it to play. I might need to come out of my slides. Here we go. Um, and so this just shows um, kind of a slow motion video of what the collapse of one of these honeycombs would look like. So they're using a mechanism we call snap through that allows these beams to snap through from one state to another. Um, and then as the load is re relieved, those um, curved beams then snap back to their original configuration. Um, and so we can use this particular technology um, to build um, all sorts of different impact isolators. We've looked at things that can um, protect sensitive equipment. We've miniaturized these so we can start looking at using them in, for example, um, sporting goods protection like helmet inserts. Um, and one of the unique things about these is that they have, um, they absorb energy at a, at a constant force threshold, which you can see here um, in this diagram. Let me get my laser pointer back out. And so once they start snapping through, they tend to do that at a constant force threshold, which is very, very useful for um, isolating impacts. Um, because if you have, for example, a mass um, that's impacting one of these honeycombs, and you know the value of that mass, and you know the force threshold at which the honeycomb absorbs energy, F equals MA. So we then know what acceleration that mass should, should expect to experience, and we can actually design for that. Uh, because most impact absorbers like, like springs, as you apply more, as you absorb more energy, you have to apply more force, but that's not true for these. As you absorb more energy, you can do it at a reasonably constant force, return to the starting point and do it all again. Um, and so here's a, an acceleration versus time plot for um, one of these honeycombs. You can see the blue plot versus a compressed honeycomb. So we can see what would happen if we drop a mass on each of these. Um, and so if we uh, drop it on the compressed honeycomb, you can see this is a 40 G acceleration that the mass experiences. So this is a five kilogram mass being dropped from a height of a few feet. And then if we engage our honeycomb and allow the architecture to work, we can drop that um, acceleration, peak acceleration by an order of magnitude. And this is pretty typical for these honeycombs. So having said that and shown you that um, background on these macro scale honeycombs, my colleagues and I thought, what, what if we could miniaturize this phenomenon? What if we could incorporate this snap through behavior into really, really small mechanisms? And if we could do that, and then we could mix these mechanisms into a matrix material like you see here, um, then perhaps we could get a material um, that dampens better than its matrix material does. And so that's the emphasis of this particular example. So if you take one of these, um, we call these inclusions. So they're about the size of a grain of rice, two millimeters across. You can see these curved beams are arranged around the outside 
Um, and so what we do is we pre-stress the material, the matrix. We take these inclusions and insert them into a matrix at a really low volume fraction, less than 1%. We preload the matrix so that those beams are almost ready to snap through. And so then when we vibrate this material, what happens is that these beams snap through and snap back um, and they absorb lots of energy because they um, amplify the strain that the surrounding matrix is experiencing. And the surrounding matrix in this example is a viscoelastic material, so it'll actually dampen and absorb some of the energy. So if we just use the matrix, we'd have a force displacement relationship that looks like this, the blue line. The inclusion looks like the purple line, and if we combine them together, we get something that looks like the green line. So once we preload to get up to about this point, as we vibrate, we get lots and lots of displacement um, at a re reasonably constant force. So we end up dissipating lots of energy um, because we amplify the displacement of the inclusion. And so what does this do for us? So here's an example where we've taken these inclusions, we've built them using micro stereolithography, which I'll talk about in a moment. And again, these are very tiny, so you almost need a magnifying glass to really see this. They're about the size of a grain of rice. Here we have a polyurethane matrix. So this polyurethane is a viscoelastic material. It naturally absorbs some energy, but we're gonna show how we can really amplify that. We take these inclusions and we embed them in that polyurethane matrix. So in this case, we have four inclusions in this matrix and they're hidden in here. You can just barely see it. We mold polyurethane with small holes where we can insert the inclusions and then we mold more polyurethane on top of it to create this encapsulated metamaterial. We take that polyurethane and we place it in this assembly. You can see the entire thing is on a shaker table. We have layers of polyurethane with inclusions in them. We have a threaded rod running through the middle of the whole assembly. We can tighten that rod to compress the material and pre-strain these elements at different amounts. Then we shake the shaker table and we look at the response of the material. So one of the things we're going to measure is what's called transmissibility, which is a measure of the ratio between the acceleration at the output, at the top of the structure, and the acceleration at the input, right? And so the lower that is, the better off we are. And if it's extremely low, it means we're shaking at the shaker table with quite large acceleration amplitudes, while the top of the structure is essentially still, right? moves very little. All right, so here we've got our transmissibility, so a measure of how much acceleration is transmitted to the top of the structure. We wanna minimize that. We have pre-strain, so how tightly do we tighten this threaded rod um, to pre-strain the material and get our inclusions right to the point where they're almost ready to snap through. And then we have frequency, so we do frequency sweeps with our shaker table. One of the things you'll notice is that this system has a resonant frequency. And you can see it at this peak um, that um, resides at a, somewhere between 300 and 400 hertz. And so at this resonant frequency, um, the system is actually amplifying the input vibrations from the shaker table. Um, and so if you could see this, the system, you would see this top of the system vibrating quite wildly. If we pre-strain it to just the right amount though, you can see it here, we can essentially completely eliminate that resonant frequency. And so what's happening is instead of all that vibration being transmitted to the top of the structure, it's being absorbed by the polyurethane at much greater levels than it otherwise would simply because these inclusions are in here and they're pre-strained to the point where they're basically snapping back and forth with the vibrations um, and causing the surrounding material to dissipate that energy because of those amplified displacements. All right, so to our, the best of our knowledge, this is actually the first example of a mechanically tunable material, metamaterial, that selectively absorbs mechanical energy. And we do it entirely mechanically. So there's no electric fields, there's no magnetic fields, there's no temperature changes or phase changes of the material. It's all mechanical. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first time that this had been accomplished. But it wasn't easy. So. It sounds easy because the first time my graduate student built this prototype and tested it, we got the results we expected. The very first time, which almost never happens. 
The reason we did it though is because we went through a very systematic design procedure to get to this point. So we basically treat uh, this material as a two level uh, multi-scale modeling problem. Um, so at the lower level, we're designing the inclusions. So we have um, geometric properties of these inclusions that we can modify. And we're looking at the properties of those inclusions, the effective stiffness in different directions, for example. At the higher level, the larger level, we're looking at designing the matrix inclusion composite. So here we have the properties of the matrix, we have the amount of pre-strain, and from that we can get um, from that we can get the actual properties of the metamaterial. So this is the smaller level, the inclusion geometry to stiffness, and this is the larger level, the matrix properties to the metamaterial properties. The way we design and interrogate those models is we use a sampling approach. So imagine each of these black dots is a sample where we, for example, can sample geometric properties, look at the properties of the inclusion, take those properties and input those into a model of the composite material and estimate how it will perform. What we really want is really high performance. So high stiffness, high damping from this metamaterial. And so we can classify the space into designs that give us that behavior and designs that don't, so green and red. We can back propagate that information to say, if we want this level of stiffness and damping, here's what the matrix and inclusion properties should look like, and here's what the geometry of the inclusion might look like. We use classification algorithms. In this case, it's a Bayesian network classifier to generalize that classification information. Um, so basically what these classifiers do is they tell us that if we have regions where we've had good designs in the past, um, we're more likely to find good designs in those regions again. We build those classifiers using sampling data. So if we have three points here that are green, so they've given us good performance, and let's say these are input parameters like um, beam thicknesses or widths or lengths in our inclusion, we then center Gaussian kernels on those points and we can aggregate those into what we call a kernel density estimate. Those kernel density estimates then enter into our Bayesian network classifier because we can build those kernel density estimates on um, points of preferred class, so high performance. <clears throat> we can also build them here in red on points of low class <clears throat> or poor performance. And then using Bayes rule, we can then generalize to say, that wherever the posterior probability of being a member of the high performance class is higher, we'll classify those points as high performance in the design space. And wherever the posterior probability of classifying the points as poor performance is higher, then we'll classify that portion of the design space as poor performance. And so we typically we use these models in, in a somewhat unique way in the sense that when you typically build a surrogate model, your input is your design variables, your output is your performance prediction, and that was what we would call a forward surrogate model. So a Gaussian process model, a neural network, a regression, all examples of these forward models. But classifiers are actually acting more as an inverse model where we tell it what performance we'd like, and then the classifier creates a mapping over our input or design variables to tell us which levels of those variables are likely to give us the performance we seek. And so that can be very useful if what you really want to do is explore the design space. So here in this case, we've got <clears throat> some performance requirements. This is our effective loss and effective stiffness. We wanna to try to maximize those. So we'd like to be over here in this region of the space where we get really high loss relative to our matrix. So if we highlight those points as being high performance points, then we can then trace that back to regions of our um, <clears throat> moderate uh, scale uh, design space here that give us that type of performance. So these are the properties, the effective properties of our inclusion in different direction, effective stiffness. And then we can trace those back here also in blue um, to particular geometric parameters um, that will give us that effective stiffness. In this case, the green regions are regions that give us negative stiffness or snap through behavior. And the blue regions are ones that give us particularly high performance in terms of loss factors, which is what we want. We can tighten that region and just look at these outer spaces here. And if we do that, we'll see our space of effective properties tightened. 
we'll also see our, our space of geometric parameters tighten. One of the things you'll notice here is a linear relationship here between these two effective stiffness, elements of the effective stiffness tensor. And you might think my graduate students saw that and thought there must have been a mistake somewhere in the analysis. But in actuality, this corresponds to a theoretical prediction from someone who published a theoretical paper a few years earlier, predicting that if we were going to get this type of, of high loss, that it was going to be from a material that had a constant bulk modulus, which means that the ratio here between these two elements of the effective stiffness tensor is constant. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. So we've actually used our classification techniques to uncover a theoretical relationship that was already known to exist. So that's really cool to be able to do that. So if we take one of these um, preferred regions of the design space and we represent it in three dimensions, <clears throat> using variables that are important to us, it looks a little bit like this green cloud. And so in this green cloud, T is the thickness of these beams, H is their apex height, and E is the modulus of the material that composes these inclusions. All right, so this is, these are a combination of variables that seem to give us good performance, but they're not all equally manufacturable. So the way we manufacture these inclusions in this case is using a microstereolithography process um, in partnership with Lawrence Livermore National Labs, where you take your design, um, you project it using um, a light source through some scanning optics onto um, a bath of monomer. So this is a liquid resin that's photosensitive. And when the light hits it in a certain pattern, then it solidifies the material. In this case, it's capable of really high resolution. You can see this is a two millimeter inclusion and the thicknesses of these thinnest walls here are somewhere around 50 to 70 microns. So this is really quite a small structure and it's still capable of snap, this snap through type of behavior that we saw earlier. And you can see that happening here with these tweezers um, that are compressing it under a microscope. So one of the things we need to know is when we build these structures, um, we see a lot of variability. So the thicknesses of the walls are not exactly what we had originally prescribed. Um, there is also some uh, variability in the geometry or shape of these walls. There's some variability in the material properties. And that has a huge influence on how these structures behave. Um, and if they don't behave as predicted, um, then they won't perform well in our shaker table tests. So what we did is we built a batch of these specimens. We characterized things like the probability distribution of the thickness of the beams, as well as the modulus of elasticity of the constituent material. And from that, we were able to get distributions on all the important properties. Using that, we could then take our mappings of the design space and narrow them based on how reliably we'd like our structures to perform. Because when it comes down to it, if we specify a thickness, apex height, material modulus, we're going to get something different. It's gonna be something from this particular probability distribution, but it won't be precisely what we um, asked for. And so we wanna make sure that despite this pro these probability distributions, that will still get good performance. Basically, if you take one of these designs and you look at where it might lie in this design space after it's manufactured, we wanna make sure that it still gives us good performance. And so once we do that, we tend to narrow these design spaces and you can see them narrowing here to these purple regions. And from that, we will actually pick the design that we choose to manufacture. And so one of the ways we do that is we take a point that's in our preferred design region that's classified as a high performance point. We center our manufacturing distribution on that point. So we know what the distribution of manufactured dimensions and material properties will be. Then we sample that distribution using our classifiers. So as we sample, take a Monte Carlo sample of this distribution, we can run each of those points through our classifier. Um, and so if they are within our preferred design region, then they're classified as good. And if they're outside of our preferred design region, they're classified as bad. And so if we take a point, say in the middle of this design region, um, then we can handle that variability and still 
um, perform well with say 90% plus likelihood. If we take a point that's near the boundary of our preferred design region, and, and then we sample with a manufacturing from a manufacturing distribution on that point, then we'll find that a very large fraction of our as manufactured samples are going to lie outside of our design region. And so we will call that um, a, a, a non-reliable point, one that, one that cannot be reliably manufactured. And so that's how we get to these reduced design spaces by taking our manufacturing distributions, Monte Carlo sampling them, and then evaluating them using our very, very rapid classifiers that we've already built. Right, and so that's how we got the high performance that we talked about earlier from our very first um, sample, from our very first prototype. All right, so that was an example of using um, test artifacts, right, building a, a small batch of these inclusions, testing them, characterizing the variability, and then bringing that into the design process using our uh, computationally efficient approaches using class pre-fit classifiers. Now what we're gonna do is our second example is to look at um, direction dependence of properties and bring that information into our design process. So this is gonna be a slightly different example. So in this example, we're gonna use powder bed fusion, also known as laser sintering. So this is a direct metal laser sintering process that builds parts out of metal powders. And it was used to build the lattice structures that you see here. And then when we zoom in on those lattice structures, you can see some of the variability. Uh, the final parts that we built for this study were better than this, but nevertheless, we've got quite a bit of variability to characterize. So here we've built a batch of these lattice structures um, and all of these are using an, a unit cell called an octet truss, which you can see here. Then they're arranged in a seven by seven by seven unit cell arrangement in a lattice structure, which you see here in CAD form. And here you can see it as built. Um, and what we do is we compress them to full density. And from that force displacement data, we can analyze the stiffness of the structures. We can also look at their strength and you can look at the plateau strength of these structures. One of the things you'll notice if you look carefully is that there are two groupings. One is pink and red, the other is blue, light and dark blue. And if you look at the legend, you'll see that uh, they were from two different builds. And those two different builds were responsible for vastly different strengths of these materials. You can all, you'll also be able to, to find, if we looked more closely, that even the stiffness is different depending on the build and also depending on the orientation with which we test these specimens. So if we try to use FEA to predict how these lattice structures will behave, um, we find that there's a very large discrepancy between the FEA and the experimental measurements. So here you can see that um, the FEA differed from the experimental measurements by somewhere between 30 and 60%, which means that it's incredibly difficult to predict how these lattice structures will behave, which makes it very difficult to design them. One of the, the first thing we did is we measured the uh, struts in the lattice structures to see if they satisfied or matched our as-designed strut diameters. So for one build, build one, they were really pretty close. Um, for the other build, they were quite a bit smaller um, than our as-designed um, size specification for these struts. Um, and so that accounted for some of the variability. And so now instead of having 60% differential, we've got something more like 30% to 40%, but it's still huge, telling us that we're not able to predict the performance of these lattice structures very well, and therefore aren't able to design them very well. And this is actually a common theme among um, additively manufactured lattice structures, especially in metals. So if we look at why that is, this is um, some images that I took from a journal paper published a few years ago by some authors from McGill University. And you'll see that, um, especially for some ori struts oriented in some directions, you'll see lots of surface roughness, so lots of variability. The profile of the struts isn't circular like it should be. Um, it has a different profile, it may be smaller, larger, um, and non-circular. Um, the deviation of the strut is quite broad from center, so you'll see thick parts and thin parts, um, characterized often as surface roughness. You'll also see that horizontal struts are particularly hard to build in this structure, 
And in this particular process, partly because um, metal laser sintering doesn't like horizontal, unsupported horizontal surfaces, because as the laser starts to melt the powder, if there isn't a structure underneath it, the powder actually gets too hot um, and it vaporizes and leaves uh, the, the, the area, which means that you get lots and lots of surface roughness and lots of um, poorly shaped melt pools when it tries to melt the material. So when this team CT scanned all of these struts and then recreated the unit cells from the CT scans and used that to analyze the structure using quite a few nodes in a supercomputer because then all of a sudden the number of elements that's required in a finite element procedure to analyze this is, goes exponentially high almost. Um, they were able to reduce their errors from 40 to 60%, which matched ours, right? I told you this was a common theme, down to approximately 10%. So maybe they're onto something. They're scanning, better representing the struts and um, simulating a geometry that looks more like what you actually fabricate. The difficulty is that this is extremely computationally expensive um, to be able to do because instead of treating these struts as say beans in a finite element analysis or treating a unit cell as a single unit, instead you have to really uh, dive into the unit cell and understand the variability and model it. And that's incre incredibly computationally expensive. So I call this the computational approach. So the green here is experiment, the yellow is modeling. And if we want to model what one of these lattice structures, how one of these lattice structures behaves, um, in this case, what they'll do is they'll do experiments on the base material. So TIE 64 or 316 stainless steel. And they'll use those base material properties as input to a finite element model. And here they will modify the geometry here to match all the stochastic behavior that you see in the built specimens. And so from here on up, they'll model everything using finite element analysis. It's incredibly computational, ex computationally expensive, but it can take into account all of these different um, imperfections that you see, shape and size and joints and porosity and so on. A different approach that we take that I'm going to show you in a second is to take a more of a hybrid experimental computational approach. So instead of just experimenting with a base material, a typical um, ten tensile specimen, what we'll do is we'll take a tensile specimen, we'll replace the gauge length um, with struts that match the size and spacing of our unit cells. We'll test those, and then we actually have effective properties that encapsulate how the struts and their underlying base material behave. It's actually a much more accurate representation because you're building these struts at the sizes and at the sizes that are representative of this overall lattice structure. And so then we take effective properties of these struts, we bring that into our lattice structure model and predict how the lattice structure will behave. So here are some examples. We've done some of these lattice structure tests where we look at um, large samples of specimens um, with different sizes of struts. And you can see that in the blue, green, and purple here with different orientations, horizontal, vertical. And some of our latest tests, we've also looked at angled specimens as well. And then from that, we can understand how these struts behave depending on how big they are and how they're angled. And then as we build bottles of these unit cells, we can take into account was the strut at a diagonal, a horizontal, a more vertical orientation, and how big was it, and how does that affect its effective properties? Here you can see some of our CT scans of some of our strut specimens. You can see that specimens that are built vertically have much better integrity than those that are built horizontally. You can also see a little bit more roughness in really, really small bars, especially when they're built horizontally. It's difficult for the process to actually get these bars going when scanning in an, in an open powder bed like this, because like I said, the powder tends to vaporize and escape. Here's some results from some testing. This is high throughput testing at Sandia National Labs by one of my graduate students, where they take these specimens, insert them into a fixture, do tension testing on it, and from that they can look at the stress strain behavior of horizontal specimens in, in dotted, dotted lines, as well as vertical specimens in solid lines. They can look at solid gauge lengths, which is the orange. They can look at um, strut gauge lengths, which is the blue. So you see a lot of variability 
But if we start looking at and dicing the data, one of the things we see is that horizontal struts tend to be quite a bit weaker than vertical ones, at least with this particular machine and process. So we take that information and we build it into the design process. When we bring it into our FEA model, for example, we that then see these errors that used to be 30 to 40% drop down to around 5%. So now we're really very accurately able to predict the properties of the lattice structure, assuming that we know the properties of the struts and that we have an anisotropic model of those. So it depends on the direction in which they're built. So what we do with that information is we use it to build a surrogate model of our unit cells. Then we use that surrogate model to optimize our lattice structures. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of these steps. So here's a unit cell, a sample unit cell. We chose to use an isotress in this example, partly because it has lattice elements that are vertical, horizontal, and diagonal, which gives us a lot of flexibility and, and um, gives us a lot of fuel to investigate these different orientations. We assume that the stiffness of these struts depends on orientation. Um, so horizontal struts have the least stiffness, vertical struts have the best stiffness, and then there's a, um, uh, a nonlinear um, smoothing law that, that moves from horizontal to vertical, right? That interpolates from horizontal to vertical. This is not zero stiffness, this is minimum stiffness, and this is maximum stiffness. And so we look at three cases here, one where um, it doesn't matter how you orient the struts, they all have the same stiffness. One where there's a moderate dependence on orientation, so the minimum here is 90 megapascals, the max is 150, and another severe case where the min is 30 gigapascals for, stiff, for stiffness and the max is 150. And I should mention that this is not technically stiffness, it's effective um, elastic modulus. And then what we do with that information is we build a surrogate model of the unit cell as a function of the diameters of these rods, as well as the angle of orientation. So in later data, we also have um, size dependence of the effective um, Young's modulus um, of the struts as well. And so we can take that into account as we build this surrogate model. So our input, in this case, we're using a, a neural network to build the surrogate model. Um, our input are the diameters of each rod, the X rods, the Y rods, the two diagonal rods, um, and the angle of orientation of this unit cell. And our output are the elements of the constitutive tensor that describes how this unit cell behaves. We fit a neural network model that can predict this, and we can also use it to provide derivatives for our um, lattice optimization a little bit later. Right? Our optimization problem here for our lattice is to minimize compliance subject to some limits on volume fraction. We also limit the normalized diameters of these lattices, lattice struts, I should say, from a small manufacturable size all the way up to a size that is a, about as large as we can get while still getting powder out of the cells. Our constitutive tensors are informed by our neural network model, right, which depends on the size of each of the elements as well as the angle of orientation. And so here are some results. Let me kind of unpack this very, very um, busy slide. It has a lot of information in it. So the optimization problem here is what's called, typically called an MBB problem. It's a beam problem with a load in the center and simple supports on either corner. <clears throat> we're minimizing the compliance of this structure. So here you can see the results if we have an agnostic, the compliance here um, is, has a value of about 27 times 10 to the seventh. Here you can see the resulting material distributions for that structure under the agnostic. You can also see how that material is distributed to X, Y, Z, and diagonal elements. Then what we do is we look at our process-aware material models. So these units, so here we're designing using our neural networks that are trained um, to take into account the size of the elements and the orientation of the struts. And in this case, um, you can see that um, we do get lower compliance, but it's not as bad as it would be if we took our agnostic model, this one basically, and just inputted those direction dependent material properties. If we did that, we'd get even worse performance. So we're actually improving the performance by as much as almost 
by instead of just designing agnostically, assuming there's no direction dependence, and then later incorporating those direction dependent properties, we get worse performance than if we consider those direction dependent properties from the very beginning. You'll also see the algorithm start to distribute material a little bit more heavily to vertical um, and diagonal struts as opposed to putting so much weight or stress or load on horizontal struts, which we've already noted, noted are quite a bit weaker. And that's part of how we get a little bit better performance. We can get even better, bigger impact from considering the angle of orientation of our lattice structure. So in this case, assume we're building this beam, this bridge, um, and we're filling it with lattice structure. But if each one of these squares is a unit cell, then what we can do is we can angle the unit cell at an angle theta relative to the build platform. We'll do that for all of these elements simultaneously. So you'll basically have a lattice structure that instead of being you know, parallel to the build platform will be at an angle while the part stays at its original orientation. So you're basically orienting the lattice structure relative to the part and the build platform. And so by doing this, we can actually get even more impact on the quality of our final performance. Um, so <clears throat> here in this case, you'll see a rotation angle of 70 degrees approximately um, that the optimization algorithm has identified as uh, the best optimization angle in this case. You might wonder why it's about the same in both cases. And that's because at that angle, we can actually avoid having any horizontal struts. So none of the struts are horizontal and none of the struts are close enough to horizontal to get really, really bad properties. And so that's a sweet spot here. There's another angle that'll give you a similar sweet spot. Here you'll see the compliance that you get and here you'll see the compliance that you would get with these direction dependent properties if you simply inserted those properties into an agnostic design. And here you can see the relative improvement that we're getting in performance by considering those direction dependent properties from the very beginning as part of our design process. So if we have a particularly direction dependent design, we may improve our performance by as much as almost 50% by taking that into account, taking our lattice structure, rotating it a little bit, putting more material in um, struts that are oriented in stronger orientations and less material on struts that are oriented in weaker orientations. And so we can get a huge benefit from doing that. So ongoing work, right? Some other things we can do here. Um, topology optimization of the unit cell. So here we took an ISO truss. We didn't really optimize the unit cell. We considered it given um, and, and took it as fixed and instead uh, decided where we were gonna put material within that unit cell. But we should be doing um, process aware design of the unit cells themselves so we can get better unit cells to start with. Um, fabricating these lattice systems. So I showed you um, comparison between FDA and experiment early on. We need to have comparison between design and experiment for the last couple of slides that I showed you as well, and we're working on that. <clears throat> we need to incorporate additional manufacturability considerations. There's a lot of things that aren't here. Um, so for example, how do you trim lattices near the edges of parts? Um, how big, how much of an overlap can you get or how long can you build horizontal struts, for example? Um, there are a lot of different considerations like that that would be useful to consider. Um, we also want to be able to use machine learning to automatically generate results of interest to the designer. So we, we go through lots and lots of iterations with lots of intermediate design results in our optimization cycles. We can use machine learning, and we've started to do that already, just to, to try to learn from those cycles and to predict more quickly. Um, what a design will look like or what a design of interest to a designer might look like. All right, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pause. I think uh, we have some time for questions um, if anyone has them. Um, and I will um, just stop there and, and open the floor for, for questions. Um, hi, yes, um, thank you for presenting. Um, I actually know one of your students, Amber, that I noticed on your um, on your title slide. So I was happy to see her name. I haven't talked to her in a while, but I should reach out to her and say, hey, you're a professor. 
presented to us. But, yeah, um... <laughs> Amber's great. She actually did all the uh, experiments at Sandia on the lattice structures. I showed, showed some of the lattice structures in the little test fixture. She did all that work. That's um, great. So she, yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah, my question was actually about those lattice structures. Um, right now, um, I guess first off, I should kind of say what my research is, but for my dissertation, I am focusing on metal additive manufacturing. And right now I'm kind of studying uh, melt pool geometry and how uh, laser parameters affect um, the melt pool geometry to part. So my question is like, how, how do you combat variability in laser power that resolves to an accurate representation of the intended structure, especially for the small strut scales that you showed uh, printed in the horizontal direction? Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question. Let's go back and look at maybe, let me pull up a, a slide that shows, um, that can help um, kind of answer some of these things. Um, so this one might be the best one. Um, so these particular, so I'm convinced um, that better scan strategies could actually give you much better performance out of these lattice structures. Um, so we're using the sort of uh, commercial, <clears throat> commercial vendors scan strategies that they typically use to build parts. And so what's happening is when you build these horizontal struts um, in metal, in DMLS, as you're, I'm sure, aware, the difficulty of building horizontal parts is that in, in, in metal powder bed fusion, you really want something underneath it to serve as sort of a, not only a physical anchor, but also a thermal anchor for that particular build zone, right? Because it changes the conductivity of the material underneath. Powders are very insulative and solid parts are, are very conductive. And so if you've got, if you're trying to build one of these horizontal struts and you've got just powder underneath it, um, the region, the powder is so insulated that as the laser scans, um, it basically vaporizes the powder. It has a lot of trouble getting those, those struts to start to form. And so that's why you see all of this um, variability in these horizontal struts. It gets better if they're bigger because essentially what we see is on the underside of the struts, you get all this roughness, these really poorly formed melt pools. And then as it builds more and more and more, it starts to find its way, right? It starts to get more uniform melt pools and those struts become more uniform. So I think that if you had a better scan strategy um, and could form a more uniform melt pool that you could do a better job of building these horizontal structures, maybe by starting by sort of warming the powder and then gradually melting it, right? And then starting to really input more powder in power into it um, to really melt the pool and start to build the part up. Um, so I think that with better scan strategies that could better control this melt pool, you could actually do a better job of building really thin horizontal structures. Right now, what this is telling us is if you, you can build horizontal, it's telling us try to maybe avoid building horizontal bars or if you can't make them a little bit bigger so you, you, they aren't quite so influenced, right, by this really big surface roughness. So I think there's a huge amount of work to be done in simulation-based um, work to understand how scan strategies affect melt pool, which sounds like it overlaps with what you're doing, and then trying to modify those scan strategies so you can build really fine features, right? Um, so this is an important application. Um, heat exchangers are a really important application where you want really thin fit fins, and you might want them to go in multiple different directions, you know, and not being constrained to having them mostly vertical. So I think you've raised a really important point. Um, and so our process right now is kind of agnostic to that um, process planning um, step and just assuming that if you're gonna build it in this machine with the typical process parameters, this is what you see. Awesome, thank you. And um, I just kind of want to follow up, would there be um, a future study where you do consider different type of scanning strategies um, and kind of repeat these types of experiments? Yeah, we'd love to do that actually. I think that's a good next step. Um, I also think it's a good next step um, to, you know, there's a lot of work behind all the data that I showed you. That was Amber's entire master's thesis, just to get the data that we needed to then do another PhD thesis to actually do the design work. Um, and so I think um, another opportunity is to think about um, 
uh, transfer learning so that we could transfer these results to another process um, without having to gather quite as much data. Because if the process is the same, the physics are the same, you're, you can probably have similar relationships. You just need to scale them in different ways. And I think that's another opportunity for, for future work as well. All right, thank you. Yeah, great questions, Emmanuel. Professor Sepeset, uh, I have a question about the, uh, you analyze the, um, first of all, this is a fantastic work. And something that I want to understand more is the, uh, you study uh, different um, dependence, like angle dependence, size dependence, and orientation dependence. Is there any, another um, one essential factor that can represent or explain all of this? Because when you analyze the um, angle dependence and you can explain it by uh, analyzing its direction, its orientation. And finally, it's kind of like the orientation can explain why the angle differences, the, the, how the angle differences uh, form like that. So is there another um, more basic and essential reason for all of this different uh, factors that affect the performance? Um, yeah, so there are certainly more basic reasons. Um, and those reasons usually have to do with the layer-based manufacturing strategy that's inherent to additive, right? Um, so the explanation depends on the process that you're using. So, um, you know, for example, here in this metal process, um, a lot of the explanations for direction dependence depend on um, melt pools, as Emmanuel was asking about. Um, they depend on microstructure and microstructure solidification, as well as heat treating as you go up layer by layer by layer. They also depend on how well you're able to melt powder particles together. And usually you're better able to do that within the layer than you are across the layers. Um, and, and, but in this case, in this metal process, um, we're actually see that sometimes the, with the struts are unique in the sense that when they're horizontal, as I described in my discussion with Emmanuel, um, that those are particularly difficult to build. Um, other processes, you know, like extrusion processes, um, they're typically, it's the opposite. Instead of having really poor horizontal features, you usually have really poor vertical features um, because you're coming back and you're building layer by layer. And so that's a more typical cause um, is the fact that you've got these discrete layers and they're not adhered together as well as they could be. Um, and so understanding those things um, is important. Um, and that is a whole line of research where people are using um, modeling techniques. Some of them are really expensive modeling techniques where they're looking at being able to do atomistic and molecular simulations of what happens to particles as they, as they coalesce, as they melt. Um, and others where you know, you're doing a little bit larger scale simulation of what happens when clumps of material attach in certain ways and arrange in certain ways. So you can certainly do simulation to um, predict the type of properties that I'm showing here. Um, and, but the simulation is expensive to do um, and needs to still be um, validated with the type of experimental results that I talked about here, right? Otherwise, it's really difficult to trust the simulation. So I'm not sure I answered your question um, all that well, but in order to understand the direction dependence of a particular additive process, you really have to understand the process. Um, and it helps to have access to, to, to really read experimental papers where people have characterized parts and they've done microscopy on parts, CT scanning of parts, et cetera, to really understand what's happening in the process. And then it also helps to look at simulation because what simulation can do for us is it can look at a lot of what ifs, what if scenarios, right? Just like my discussion with Emmanuel, what if we change the, the scanning strategy? We can't try a thousand different scan strategies in a machine because the builds are too expensive, but we could try a thousand perhaps, or maybe not that many, but a hundred or a dozen or something like that, at least in a simulation. 
Um, and that will help us do what if strategies to say, okay, we understand what's happening. Now, how can we make it better, right? And so those things are all really important for improving your process. Um, I keep coming back to, um, Froke and Janet will appreciate this. I remember as a graduate student um, at Georgia Tech when Froke and Janet were still there, we had a colleague, David Rosen, who's still very active in additive manufacturing. And I still remember one of his main philosophies, which was, if you're going to design for a process, you really have to understand the process. And there's no substitute for that. Um, so anyway, I'm not sure that fully answered your question, but um, those are the things that, that, that came to mind as I listened to you ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that explains a lot. And um, I'm so sorry, I have a follow-up question uh, that, um, do you see any connection between this uh, additive manufacturing with, um, with like supply chain or cyber physical uh, systems? Are there any joint um, subjects of this? Yes. Um, so I don't think people have, a, have started exploring this in depth as much as they will soon. Um, but actually even quality control and reliability is a supply chain issue for um, additive manufacturing. So it matters um, where your raw materials come from. It matters a lot, as a matter of fact. So you could use two materials that are all, that are both labeled, say 17.4 pH stainless steel. And if you look at two different materials from two different vendors, they'll have different impurities in them. Um, you know, and impurities have a huge impact on microstructure and properties. So they may have slightly different chemical compositions, which they really shouldn't have. Um, they'll have different powder sizes, which it would be nice if they didn't have. Um, so you have these powders, you know, that are different. Every machine is different. So whereas, you know, if you open up, you know, a toaster, right, that's been made by by Braun or, or one of these companies that makes toasters, they're all gonna pretty much look the same, really very, very close the same. But these additive manufacturing machines, you know, some of them are, are almost like, uh, you know, the cereal, it's almost like different children, right? They have slightly different components inside. They've been upgraded at different times with different components. Their software is at different levels of upgrade. The machines are at different states of maintenance. Um, so windows get clouded, um, lasers lose their laser power after a while, um, sensors start to move away from a good state of calibration. Um, so all of these things, right, are really important. It matters how you test them. So I'm thinking supply chain more broadly, right, from um, raw materials all the way to qualified part. It matters how you test them. Um, how's your Instron machine calibrated? Are you using an extensometer or are you using a, a camera-based digital DIC system to do your data collection? And that matters because then that, those two systems are different and they introduce different levels of uncertainty in the data that you get out. So if you think about you know, all these things that, um, that kind of insert themselves in between here's a qualified part and here's where we started, uh, that supply chain is actually huge. There are also issues with supply chain disruption. And so um, this is an, an interesting fact that a couple of years ago, um, there was a fire in a German factory that makes plastic powders. Um, and you might say, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, at the time it was the only, or maybe one of a, two, factories that made powder that laser sintering machines could use, polymer laser sintering machines. So when that machine had, a, that factory had a fire, um, a bunch of folks that we know um, ended up stockpiling powder because they were afraid they wouldn't be able to buy it anymore, right? And that's their bread and butter. So there are also supply chain disruption issues that can be important. Um, and we, we've seen that happen. Um, and if we buy powder from another supplier, we don't have the same properties. We can't qualify the parts in the same way. Um, and so it's a huge supply chain disruption then. Thank you, this is very helpful. 
These are great questions. Awesome questions. So Carolyn, let me tell you, there's a reason for asking uh, uh, for Lynn's question where she's talked about, uh, she asked about supply chains. Uh, we are in a supply chain, when you have a supply chain, uh, typically uh, one looks at uh, managing the flow between the supply and the demand, and there may be multiple suppliers and multiple demand things. So that's where the network is fixed. Yeah. But then you talked about fires and changes like that. That means that the structure of the network has to be changed and people have done that work. Two years ago, we published a monograph based on two PhDs where we are able to do, do the both of those things simultaneously. We are able to take care of the flow and at the same time, take care of the, the, uh, the change in the structure. And uh, again, just like you said, I think we are the only people who can do it simultaneously and have demonstrated it. So that's where this is coming from. And where Lynn is going is the following. Uh, for she's going to be a faculty member and what she's looking for uh, her, her uh, uh, career plan for research is on self evolving or self organizing cyber physical social systems. Mm -hmm. So what we see in 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 uh, in terms of cyber physical systems, you've got that. But the social portion has to come into it because of these disturbances, how uh, people deal with the environment, uh, what impact it has, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the hypothesis that we have is that if we're able to model uh, this supply network as a multi-echelon supply network, a multi-echelon supply chain. So we could say, all right, the supplier of the powder is one chain. The, uh, the second one is another thing. The verification that you've talked about is another chain then when there is a disturbance or there is a variation, how does the system react to that? And so that's the direction in which she's going uh, with her post PhD activity. It is a self-organizing cyber physical social system. And the key here, the reason she's asking these questions is that the, if we're able to model the supply network using services, that means it's agnostic to the application. Then guess what? Uh, we can use that model for additive fabrication, manufacturing using additive, additive fabrication, bringing in the suppliers, bringing in the distributors, bringing in the qualifiers, bringing in all these sorts of things. And we can use that also for rural development or healthcare. It doesn't matter because the problem remains the same. Right. So that's the background from where uh, Lynn is coming. So any advice you can give Lynn on that, it'll be very helpful. She's right now writing her I statement for her PhD. Yeah, which you are undoubtedly familiar with. Yeah. Yeah, I would say just, you know, from from the additive perspective. You know, in the theme of the talk that we discussed here, one of the things I would be interested in seeing is Anytime you shift, anytime you change your supply chain. So <clears throat> let me give you an example. Um, there's a, a lot of um, laser sintering work takes place around Austin, partly because it was kind of born at the University of Texas. But um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was, I was walking through one of our, our big uh, companies next to us that, that build parts for, for companies they're a service bureau, that's what they do. They take designs and they build them. And they were in the middle of qualifying parts for a large energy company. And I don't know the specific application, um, but it was probably for a gas turbine. So it was a really um, you know, critical part that they were trying to build. And all of their metals machines, they had like eight of them on the shop floor, which is you know a huge investment. That's like a $10 million investment. All but one of them were, were sealed down doing qualification for this part. Um, and so as part of qualification, they kind of nailed down the vendor of the powders, they nailed down the machine, um, the version of the machine. Um, and <clears throat> once they qualify a part, they don't want to change anything. So they're very risk averse, right? 
Um, and so one of the things that um, would be interesting to look at is how this risk aversion impacts the supply chain, right? So as you, um, so for example, you know, one thing could be one way that a company like that could react to a potential supply chain disruption would be to stockpile things, right? So you stockpile powders, you buy a couple of extra machines just in case the company stops selling them, right? You basically stockpile things so you have an insurance policy against um, changing anything. And then another way that you would handle this is to say, well, we're just gonna have to change at some point. But every time you do that, there's a cost, right? Because you're changing an important variable, like what powder material you're using or um, you know, the version of the machine and therefore it's thermal environment. And so it's going to, there's going to be a cost, right, to qualifying or requalifying that part of that process. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of explore that and see sort of the interplays between that. And in particular, how risk aversion, right, comes into the picture. And if someone, if, if a part is really critical, that usually means that the people making it and designing it are very risk averse. Right, a part where if it breaks, it brings an aircraft down or grounds an aircraft. That's those people are going to be very risk averse. Uh, similarly, for something that is being used, like in an energy company, to drill, you know, if it stops their drilling for a day, that could mean a hundred hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost um, revenue for them. So those people tend to be very risk averse. On the other hand, you have um, companies that are maybe building consumer products or things that go into automobiles or other things like that where they're far less risk averse because a mistake is not so costly. And there, I think that the way they handle their supply chains may be quite different um, and the ramifications for profitability, um, inventory, um, all those sorts of things, um, alternative qualification routes, things like that um, are very different. And it'd be interesting to, to, to look at that, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, I, it sounds like it's uh, much about the balance between adaption and standardization and some kind of balance between swiftness and uh, robustness. Uh, I, need, I know I need to explore more to give a proper summary. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, it's a real industry 4.0 problem, isn't it, right? Mm -hmm, we want to yeah. have this adaptable, agile industry, but, mm -hmm, yeah. uh, but there are costs to that, right? Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, of confidence, right, in your system as you start to change things. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments, questions? So who would, uh, what are the, some of the takeaways uh, from our usual people? Uh, Swapnil, takeaway, comment. Ali, takeaway, comment. Tanmir, Mahamad, takeaway, comment. Reza, Roshan. Janet, your turn. Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah. it was very interesting for me to see how uh, simulation and how you try to model the problem statement and how you drew a lot of insights from it. It was very interesting to see because generally I, I mean, being in the experimental field, I always felt that you have to individually take out all those factors, but seeing your simulation and uh, seeing that it, there's another way where you can actually directly go to a problem, like the solution of the problem. That was very interesting for me. I really liked it. Hopefully I can uh, do the same for my experiments as well. That would be nice for me to do it. Anybody else? Swapnil, Reza, Emmanuel, Reza, uh, Mohammed. Hello, Dr. Uh... Caroline. Um, my name is Tanvir. I'm a graduate student over here in the AME department of OU. So um, I'm, I'm very uh, 
I, I want to thank you for your presentation. That's a very nice presentation and I really liked it and enjoy it. So I don't have that, mu uh, that much question. I have just one curiosity about uh, learning that during your presentation, you, you said you use the machine learning techniques to uh, identify, um, identify. So in that case, so what kind of, or which algorithms you usually used on, on that machine learning techniques? Uh, so in that case, the first example that I used, we used some fairly simple algorithms, actually. They're um, naive uh, Bayesian network classifiers. Um, there's a number of different classification algorithms out there. Um, some of them are, tend to be a little bit more accurate than the Bayesian classifiers, um, but we use the Bayesian classifiers partly because they're Bayesian um, and they have some additional benefits to us that they can um, also provide you know, prior built prior probabilities that we can use to support um, sequential sampling, for example, um, so that we can inform sample, further sampling in the space based on either where we don't have much information or where we think we may have good designs. Um, so we have some reasons for using those. Um, and then we've, um, there's some other work that, that I didn't show that follows on to some of this. Um, in terms of, for example, visualization, visual, visualizing higher dimensional design spaces. Um, and so, you know, we've used some other algorithms like TSNI and things like that. Um, we've also used um, things like convolutional neural networks and generative adversarial networks and things like that from machine vision um, to be able to learn from geometries that we've generated to basically um, create reduced order mappings of those geometries. I didn't present that work today either, um, but that's, that's been quite interesting um, to be able to use that um, in, in what we've done. So there ten, tend to be some parallels actually between you know um, analyzing images and then a analyzing design spaces as well because you're often um, you know presenting data in design spaces as sort of uh, maps, right? Um, that, that look visually a little bit like other images. So image processing techniques can be useful there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so did you, uh, did you uh, check any, anything or did you uh, like um, uh, comparative and did any comparison analysis between the algorithms or something like that? And you found anything that they have the higher accuracy or the uh, true positive or true negative, uh, something yeah. like of that. Did you explore some, some kind of that stuff? Yeah, we definitely did. Actually, about a year or so ago, we published a paper um, in the Journal of Mechanical Design where we compared different classification algorithms for design exploration, specifically for that. And we looked at problems with different numbers of dimensions and problems with different levels of modality, right? Um, smooth versus very uh, multimodal design problems. Um, and compared, and it's actually, you, you know, you could, um, if you send me an email, I can send you the reference to the paper or the paper, but it's actually kind of difficult sometimes to, to draw universal conclusions because it really does depend a lot on the type of problem that you're trying to solve because every algorithm has its own strengths and weaknesses. Um, some need more data to be able to train accurately, some generalize better, um, you know, so there's just a, a number of different, you know, pluses and minuses about some of the different algorithms that are out there. So Karen, if you sent me the paper, I'll, I'll send it off to Tanvi. Okay. Thank I'll you. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Farooq for helping us. Sure. We're delighted. And uh, I'm sure Carolyn is open to receiving uh, feedback, comments, further questions, stuff like that, right, Carolyn? Sure. So you have her email address, you know who she is, you know where she is, so feel free to communicate with her. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, if so Dr. Carolyn, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, um, if, you, if you think like, um, I have another curiosity, probably I will contact you in later on about your another publication, but not in presented in today's seminar. So I'm not doing any, asking any question or anything regarding of, of that paper. So probably later on, I will contact you on regarding that paper. Okay. Swapnil, any comments 
Uh, not really. I really uh, like the presentation. Uh, there are some few interesting things like uh, at the beginning where we, uh, like I actually I had one question that why was the weight person, uh, the percentage of the composite selected as uh, 1% or like less than 1%? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the reason is because, um, well, first of all, we don't need any more than that to get the high levels of loss that we saw. Um, but second of all, we actually, if we keep the volume fraction of inclusions low, then you do not change the stiffness of the underlying matrix. So we're actually getting a lot more loss without sacrificing any stiffness. And that's a fundamental trade-off that you'll typically see in like Ashby plots, for example, right? If you want a lossy material, mm -hmm. you move towards a rubber, which has low stiffness. If you want a high stiffness material, you move more towards you know, high strength metals, for example, which have very, very low loss factors. Um, so that's a trade-off that you typically experience and this material aims to break that trade-off, right? Uh, yeah, that's that makes sense, yeah. Thank you for that. All right, Janet, would you like to summarize, close, thank? Right. <laughs> Fine, so we certainly are fascinated by, by this. It's great to see where you've taken your PhD and how you've developed. We really like that. I'm particularly interested, and I think Reza will be interested too, in how you did reverse use of metamodeling. Of course, that's something that we've been interested in before. So I think that's one of the things that Reza is interested in for his PhD uh, work. So thank you. We certainly appreciate your presentation. And um, look forward to continuing talking to you. Bye. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.